Dinosaurs. Yes, what about dinosaurs? They're beloved of children, and it is a very powerful marketing tool on the part of the evolutionists to push dinosaurs to children because they are a ready market to absorb the wonders of all these strange creatures which we can't see today. And it's their means of plugging evolution and millions of years of the age of the Earth. So what I want to do this afternoon is to try and reset that picture within a biblical framework. When I was young, and there was a time when I was young, a long time ago, um, I, nobody explained dinosaurs to me, and I had a mental block. I, I, I couldn't cope with them. All my friends were interested in talking about dinosaurs and books about dinosaurs, but I, I, I pushed them out, out of my mind because I, I couldn't see how they fitted into the Bible. And it wasn't until, you know, mid-teens probably that the penny dropped that we can fit them within the orbit of the Bible. And it's a wonderful part of God's creation. And all sorts of things then drop into place. And all the problems that the evolutionists have because of the many finds that are found which uh, negate their idea of millions of years, we can take comfort. Well, we, we can fit it within God's framework of creation. But this is what our children are being bombarded with. And you see the subtle way in which they're trying to convey the accuracy when they talk about 231.4 million years. And you see, you read that and you think, well, yeah, there must be some basis in that. They can accurately do it to 0.4 of a, a, a million of a year. But of course, that's all uh, part of the marketing. And so these dinosaurs are supposed to exist 231.4 million years ago and died out 66 million years ago. It's a bit hard to get our heads around such long figures. I, I can cope with creation at 6,000 years. And I can draw a line there, and I reckon these screens are about two metres long. So that line there... Two metres long on your screens is representing six, nearly said the wrong word, didn't I? <laughs> 6,000 years. So if that's the scale, on that scale, if 6,000 years is a line two metres long, then how long would a line have to be to be 231.4 million years? Well, multi-choice questions. Hands up if the answer is A. How quick are you at your maths? Hands up if your answer is B. Hands up if your answer is C. A lot of you don't seem to have an answer. Yeah, there's a quick way of just checking which one. Yes, of course it is C. So that line has got to be 38,500 times longer. So, well, here we are in Swanwick. So that line's got to be 77 kilometres, or for those of my generation, about 48 miles away. So that takes in... Scunthorpe and uh, Loughborough and Coventry down at the bottom and Manchester there. So that's the kind of distance that, that line's got to be to represent what they are claiming is the time when the dinosaurs first came to being. But you see, there are a lot of problems with this millions of years ago because not all the remains of dinosaurs are fossilised. They found fresh dinosaur bones. Uh, they've also recently, fairly recently, found that within these fossilised bones is samples of blood and blood cells, and uh, that shouldn't be. And we also have around the world many depictions of creatures which don't exist today, but when we open our dinosaur book, we can say, oh, well, that creature depicted there looks very much like a dinosaur, which was supposed to have died out millions of years before man came on the scene. And along with the fossils where the dinosaur bones are found are the remains of plants and other animals. And those same plants and those same animals are with us to this day, unchanged. So you know, there are some problems with millions of years ago. So what we're aiming to do this afternoon is to look at the dinosaurs, see some of these uh, depictions of dinosaur-like animals, 
look at living fossils and living dinosaurs um, on the suspect of finding fresh um, bones and uh, blood and that kind of thing. And then I ask the question, well, why don't we find dinosaurs in the Bible? Why can't we look up our strong concordance and look under D, I, and no, there's no entry there. Why not? Are they there? And that's, uh, I hope we shall see. And we shall see how that these creatures are part of God's creation, living with man, and their demise was mainly caused by the flood and the change conditions after the flood. So dinosaurs have a, a distribution, oh, Jurassic Park, we might not get there. Um, don't worry too much about that. Um, we shall see, we shall see. See whether I get distracted. Um, so, yeah, dinosaur remains can be found all over the world. They're not specific to one, any one country. Go all over the world and you'll find dinosaur fossils. Uh, many of them are huge, and these are the ones that stick in the mind. You can see there a man for scale, uh, and so these will be towering way above a man. I did mean to try and estimate how tall this building is. Um, 6, 12. So it's about, this is about 4 metres uh, to the ceiling, I would guess. No, a bit more than that, 5 metres. 6, 12. Yeah, about 5 metres. So um, th these, these creatures here, the Brachiosaurus, 13 metres high, so, you know, way, way above. Um, Supersaurus, about 17 metres, and the Sauropodian, about 18 metres tall. So very, very big. So for... The older folk, 42 feet, 55 feet, 59 feet. Just last year was the reports of a discovery of, of the biggest one that they have found so far, found in Argentina. And just to give you an idea of the scale of the size of the bones, uh, this chap is lying on one of the bones. It's huge, isn't it? And they call this the titanosaur. Um, so about 20 metres, 65 feet and in length about 40 metres long now some of you might have seen me pacing the room earlier uh, it wasn't I was uh, wanting a walk or exercise but this is about 32 metres long and about 17 metres wide so uh, we've got to go way out the door if its tail was up against that end 40 metres is another 8 metres uh, out the door huge they're not all big. Some of the dinosaurs are only the size of chickens. They range in size from very small to very big. As well as the um, dinosaurs, which we think were majority were plant eaters, say different sizes, there are also fossil remains of sea creatures uh, and huge flying reptiles with uh, a wingspan which would be virtually the width of this. So you, you imagine a bird flying over you, which is wingspan, you know, coming this direction, uh, is as wide as this room. It'd be pretty frightening, wouldn't it? Now, the thing about dinosaurs, as with all the other fossils, we don't find intermediate fossils. We, we find these fossil creatures, but there's no missing links. Um, and the other thing you've got to bear in mind that even the pictures that I'm showing you are all artistic representations. We do not know what they look like. Uh, and the problem is, normally, you just got a jumble of bones, and from those bones, you're giving a, an artist the license to just draw it as he imagines. Uh, and even if we had a pretty complete set skeleton, which very rarely does one get, it's usually just all jumbled up, and you've got to piece them together as best you can. But... Even if you had a complete skeleton, it's impossible to know what the creature originally looked like. Uh, this is uh, a small skeleton, and one could very well draw it as a young lion cub. In actual fact, it is the skeleton of a poodle, but you, know, you wouldn't know from the bones. There's nothing to indicate what it looked like. Uh, and this one, you could uh, very well draw it as a turkey. But in fact, this is the skeleton of a peacock. But again, th there's nothing from the skeleton that would indicate 
the huge difference between a turkey and a peacock. And I say, normally, you've just got a slab of rocks, a mixture of rocks. But as I said in the beginning, we don't get all our information about dinosaurs just from the fossils. There are these depictions around the world. Uh, many historical accounts of large creatures terrifying the local population and ancient pictures depicting them. And one of the most famous is in Babylon, um, where Nebuchadnezzar was. He built this city and he had his artists creating wonderful tiles around the walls of Babylon. Pictures that you can recognise of horses and lions and all sorts of creatures. But then in among them are these strange ones, like this one here. Have you noticed the difference between the front and the back? Paws at the front and claws at the rear. Now, I've never seen anything like that. Did the artist have a lot of cheese the night before and had bad dreams and made it up? Or was this a creature that was existent in their day? And along with all the others, he just depicted it. Well, we'll never know that because we weren't there. And around the world, there are stories about dragons. Uh, George the dragon, George slaying the dragon. Uh, not very far from where we live in the Midlands, uh, at Breeden, outside Leicestershire, is uh, this church. It goes back to the 8th, 9th century AD, of course. Um, and carvings around. Again, a lot of things you can look and see and see what it is, but... There are sections like this one here, let's just enlarge it up, which are strange bipedal creatures. In other words, uh, they've got four limbs, but walk on two, and the others are more like arms. Okay, and you have to say, well, how did these come to be depicted like that? It, it makes sense when you see all the other creatures around that these were creatures which the carver was acquainted with, and put them in there. If one ever goes up to Carlisle and goes into the cathedral there, you'll see a carpet in the little pathway, and if you lift that carpet when nobody's watching, you'll see underneath is a tomb, uh, a stone tomb with brass um, pieces inserted into it. So that, that, that's the reality on the... Let's see back to front on it's very difficult when you can't see the screens. I can't point to it. Um, yeah, that, that's the photograph, and this is a, a, a picture of what it is. And you can see that there is wording all the way around the perimeter. And um, between each individual words, there is uh, a little picture um, depicting various things and four different sorts of fish, and there's a wolf, and there's. Uh, birds and there's bears and all sorts but in among these creatures are the strange uh, taking the top bit there two creatures next to neck and overlapping like that and you can see on the tail of this one that it's got spikes it looks a bit like a head but that's actually its tail with some spiky bits um, uh, on it now, those aren't any creatures that we've seen. I don't go outside the door here and find such creatures wandering around. But no, did they exist in the time when this tomb was put together um, uh, 800 years ago? And the one at the bottom, um, again, very much we would call that uh, one of the saurus ones, of many varieties of uh, dinosaurs which look very much like that. Um, we find in Mexico clay representations of creatures. And again, you notice on this one the zigzag spikes, as it were, along its back and rather fearsome teeth. Well, it's not a creature we see today, but when we look at the dinosaurs, there are some which would match that. In fact, this, this one is in uh, Cambodia, a carving on a temple. And you would swear that that is, uh, if you're up to it in the uh, dinosaur words, that this is a stegosaurus. Just how they appear in your books. It's happy like that. Now, I don't know how long ago this was carved. It will be hundreds of years ago. <laughs> long before... Dinosaur bones were discovered and books and representations were made. 
So how is it that this person was able to depict a Stegosaurus um, without having seen one? It makes much more sense that, yes, this was a creature that he was acquainted with, contemporary with man. This, I'm afraid, isn't terrible. You can just see very faintly, in out, this is in uh, Utah, uh, the outline of a man, very faintly, and there's an arrow pointing there, and then below it, uh, the person that did this has uh, gone over it, as it were, so you can see, but very much like a, a, a sauropod dinosaur. So there's a man and a dinosaur existing together, not millions of years apart. Uh, and here, in the middle of this, this is a carved stone, and in the middle you can see a man but a very fearsome creature that I don't recognise from any creatures that are existent today. This is about 2,000 years ago. So, you know, we're getting the idea that perhaps man was contemporary with the dinosaurs. And then we have these living fossils. You see, we're persuaded that because it is a fossil, then it's something very, very old and doesn't exist today. And there are many creatures, and one of the most famous examples is the coleocan, which was known from fossil remains until quite recently. And it was said that it had been um, wiped out 65 million years ago. And yet in 1938, uh, it was discovered that this creature was alive and swimming, hadn't changed over... 65 million years. Uh, so again, that begins to make us think that there must be something wrong with a time scale, that here is a creature, unchanged, still alive today. And uh, the Komodo dragons. These really look like many of the dinosaurs, but these were only discovered just over 100 years ago. 1912 was the first time that white man set his eyes on these uh, Dragons, and they're described as being a prehistoric age of the reptiles. But they are living. They are alive. And uh, about 12 years ago, no, not as long as that, uh, seven years ago, uh, in Australia, they, they found this uh, huge skeleton, and from it they made this model which uh, toured the museums, and you can see it in Sydney's uh, museum, uh, and I have to admit, well, really, it's just a bigger scale Komodo dragon. But, you know, this is supposed to have been, uh, well, they just put this very modestly at 20,000 years ago. But uh, we will come back to that. Uh, this creature, the Okapi, uh, was part of the alleged evolution of the horse and used to be depicted in the sketches of how... Uh, a horse is supposed to have evolved, the missing links, which, of course, time goes on, they find those links uh, aren't links at all. And they've now discovered that this creature is still alive and, uh, I was going to say, kicking. Uh, do horses do kick, don't they? Yes. And not only animals, but, as I say, in among the fossils are remains of plant vegetation. And in my garden, I have a ginkgo biloba tree, it has a very distinctive leaf, and one can see in the fossils at the time of the dinosaurs <coughs> that uh, ginkgo biloba trees were there and unchanged. So again, it just makes you think, well, is the time scale wrong? As well as the Komodo dragons, there are many stories that come out of Central Africa about these huge creatures living in the deepest jungles, which when my white man goes along with his books of dinosaurs, uh, the natives will say, um, yeah, that, that particular dinosaur depiction, that's what this creature is that lies deep in the heart of the jungle. And they, they call it the, the blocker of the river. It's a huge creature. Now, no white man has seen it. There have been exp expeditions to try and find it, um, Maybe it is imagination. We can't be sure. But uh, we can be a bit more sure about these. Um, I have some link with this uh, Blashford Snell, who is uh, an explorer. Um, we have a telephone in our 
bedroom and it was on the side of Anthea's side of the bed but when I was away and about two or three o'clock in the morning couldn't even tell you just when but the phone went and Anthea picked up the phone and this voice said Blash for Snell here and she is quick as lightning I mean normally she wasn't that quick at night time she said this is the Queen of Sheba here and put the phone down <laughs> I would love to meet him and say, do you remember when you missed dial? <laughs> yeah, but anyway, um, this is back in 15 years ago. He was in Nepal doing exploration and came across these Nepalese elephants, which white man had never seen before. And they have a very distinctive hump, which uh, is circled there. Now, when you go and look at so-called prehistoric animals in cave paintings, these are in France, you can see they've got exactly this uh, same hump. Uh, uh, and yet here is a creature that is still alive um, and uh, only discovered within probably most of all your lifetimes. So, you know, things aren't quite what they seem with ages. And it is, there it is. So, you know, if that creature just put its head down a bit more as depicted on the caves, then, you know, that's exactly the shape you would have had. Back in 61, this geologist found a big slab of bones and they were fresh bones. And so he assumed that they must have been uh, bison bones. And it took them 20 years before they realised that, no, these weren't bison bones. These were bones of dinosaurs, various sorts of dinosaurs. But they hadn't been fossilised. They were still what we would term fresh. And this article said, how could these bones have remained in a fresh condition for 70 million years is a perplexing question. Well, yes, it would be a perplexing question if they were 70 million years. But if they had died subsequent to the flood or in the flood, then there is no problem at all. And, you see, the geological column is supposed to tell us about the long ages, the millions of years of the life of the Earth. But it's much more reasonable <laughs> to look at the so-called geological column and think of it as being the timetable of the extinction of the animals in the flood. Not millions of years, but a year, and the smaller creatures being obliterated first, and more generally, you know, the bigger, the stronger the creature, the longer it could survive in the flood, and so was uh, overwhelmed later on. And we always find fossils associated with water flow stratification and we very often find that the bones of these creatures are all pointing in one direction which makes sense if it's a water flow but doesn't really make sense if an animal is just going to die it doesn't say well everybody else is facing that direction so I'm going to die facing that direction it doesn't make sense does it but it does with the flood and it also explains why we find footprints of dinosaurs or other reptiles and even humans at lower levels than we find the actual bodies of the creatures. So, you know, which came first, the chicken or the egg? Which came first, the footprint or the dinosaur? Well, the geological column says the footprint came first, and then millions of years later, the actual animal came to be. Well, it doesn't make sense, does it? But you see, it does make sense with the flood geology, that these are the remains of the effect of the flood, Yes, the footprints are going to be lower because the creatures are going to survive for a few more days or a few, few more weeks and therefore be higher up the layers. So this is from the Smithsonian Magazine, May 2006, and it was headed, Dinosaur Shocker, probing a 68 million year old, put in vertical comes around that, uh, Tyrannus Rex, this Mary Swatletzer stumbled upon astonishing signs of life that may radically change our view of the ancient beasts. She announced that she had discovered blood vessels and structures that looked like whole cells inside that bone, the first observation of its kind. The finding amazed colleagues who had never imagined that even a trace of still soft dinosaur tissue could survive 
after all, as any textbook will tell you, this is Smithsonian, this is not me, um, tell you that when an animal dies, soft tissues such as blood vessels, muscles and skin decay and disappear over time. Why hard tissues like bone may gradually acquire minerals from the environment and become fossils. But she used modern techniques and has upended the conventional wisdom by saying that some of the rock hard fossils, tens of millions of years old, may have remnants of soft tissues hidden in their interiors. But as I say, they, they can't fathom it out. But in a biblical framework, we can. Right, so let's come to the Bible. Why don't we find dinosaurs in the Bible? But it's very simple. It's only going to take one slide. The word dinosaur was only coined in 1842. So you will not find a reference to the word dinosaur in any book that was written before 1842. Um, this Richard Owen, a uh, British um, paleontologist, conjured up the word because they were finding these big bones and he was putting together these two Greek words, dinos and saurus, a fearful, terrible, great, uh, a, a lizard or a reptile, put those together to make the word dinosaur. But do we find descriptions of dinosaur type creatures in the Bible. Well, what does Genesis chapter 1 tell us? Genesis chapter 1 tells us that in the beginning uh, God created all sorts of creatures and among them, verse 21, uh, God created great sea creatures, authorised version whales, uh, and every living creature that moveth with which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind and the winged fowl. So God created great sea creatures. It tells us that. And we uh, let me just look at those uh, two words. And great is just a straightforward um, Hebrew word. And the, the other, the, the marine or land monster. Very often this word gets translated dragons, and the, if you look in uh, uh, Strong's, so you'll get 35 references to dragons. Now, I want to introduce you to Job chapter 40, and here is God's description of the biggest and the bestest of God's creation as far as land animals were concerned. Now, the book of Job, Job lived not very long after the flood. The book of Job is really the earliest complete book because Genesis spans it but goes on beyond the time of Job. Very early book. And God is challenging Job to consider God's handiwork, the mighty power that God has. And uh, this is, I'm just using New King James, just makes it a little bit crisper here. So, in verse 15 of Job chapter 40, God is challenging Job. Look at this creature. And he calls it uh, behemoth. Look now at the behemoth, which I made along with you. He eats grass like an ox. See now his strength is in his hips and his power is in his stomach muscles. He moves his tail like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are tightly knit. His bones are like beams of bronze. His ribs are like bars of iron. He is the first of the ways of God. Only he who made him can bring near his sword. Surely the mountains yield food for him and all the beasts of the field play there. He lies under the lotus trees in the covert of reeds and marsh. The lotus trees cover him with their shade. The willows by the brooks surround him. Indeed, the river may rage. Yet he is not disturbed. He is confident, though the Jordan gushes through his mouth, though he takes it in with his eyes, or one pierces his nose with a snare. In other words, he's not afraid of anything. Now, that word behemoth is an interesting word. It's a plural word in the Hebrew. Uh, and occasionally, this is a, a technique that Hebrew uses as a, a, a plural of intensity and as he puts it here uh, the beast of beasts this is the beast of beasts and therefore is given a plural name it's a singular beast but 
given a plural name to emphasize this is the top of my creation as far as land animals are concerned, Job, and is not afraid of you, you're afraid of him. And he is a creature that you cannot capture. So we're told that Behemoth, is this beast of beasts, is contemporary with Job. No good talking about animals and describing this animal if Job wasn't aware of it. So it's clear that he lived at the same time as Job. Uh, an animal of great strength, had a tail which is compared to a cedar. Now in the Middle East, the cedar tree, and there are some up in the garden and down there, cedar trees, they are the biggest trees in the Middle East. And their characteristic is that they have branches which go out horizontal. And it's described as the chief of the ways of God and absolutely fearless. Now, if you've got marginal references uh, in your Bible, it will either say a hippopotamus or an elephant. But I challenge you, what hippopotamus has a tail like a cedar? It has a pathetic little tail. And, I mean, the elephant's not much better, is it? No, it's, it's neither of those creatures. It's much more like the depictions we have of these dinosaur-type creatures. Now, very interestingly, because I am of the age of the dinosaurs, that old, my dinosaur book that I had when my children were young shows these creatures with their tails dragging behind them, a uh, most uh, inconvenient uh, structure to have at the back of you, why didn't evolution make it better? Well, it is because man misunderstood. And it's quite a few years ago now, but there was a time when the museums of the world shut and they rejigged their skeletons of dinosaurs to lift their tails up. They found that they weren't something that just dragged uselessly on the ground. They were a wonderful counterweight. So a much more modern uh, skeleton picture of this um, Brachiosaurus it is showing that as a wonderful counterweight to this huge long neck with its head above there. Now, you know, such a creature like that, he moves his tail as a cedar. Well, that you can imagine that's exactly what would happen if you were anywhere near it. You would just probably get, at the very least, knocked off your feet. Or, like the children running down the corridors, you know, knocked over. But uh, it probably would kill you, the whack of that. So it's much more likely that God is describing one of these creatures. And these creatures were alive <coughs> and known to Job contemporary with them. And, and then God, in the next chapter, but I mean, it continues on, there isn't a break, uh, deals with the sea creatures and shows us the top dog as far as sea creatures are concerned. Now, I have abbreviated this, i uh, put the verses in there, but it's a long description, a wonderful description, but it would take too long. So I've just uh, abbreviated a bit. Can you draw, and this is called Leviathan, with a hook, or snare his tongue with a line which you lower? Can you put a reed through his nose or pierce his jaw with a hook? Can you fill his skin with harpoons or his head with fishing spears? Lay your hand on him, remember the battle, never do it again. Indeed, any hope of overcoming him is false. Shall one not be overwhelmed at the sight of him? No one is so fierce that he would dare stir him up. I will not conceal his limbs, his mighty power, or his graceful proportions. Who can open the doors of his face with his terrible teeth all round? His rows of scales are his pride, tightly shut up as with a seal. One is so near another that no air can come between them. They're all joined one to another. They stick together and cannot be parted. His sneezings flash forth light, and his eyes are like the eyelids of the morning. Out of his mouth goeth burning lights. Sparks of fire shoot out. Smoke goes out of his nostrils as from a boiling pot and burning rushes. His breath kindles coals and a flame goes out of his mouth. Strength dwells in his neck. Though the sword reaches him, it cannot avail. Nor does spear, dart or javelin. He regards iron as straw and bronze as rotten wood. His undersides are like sharp, sharp potsherds. He spreads pointed marks in the mire. 
He makes the deep boil like a pot. He makes the sea like a pot of ointment. On earth there is nothing like him, which is made without fear. He beholds every high thing. He is king over all the children of pride. So a wonderful description, isn't it, of this creature, sea creature, which God says is the top of the my creation. He is the king. You're afraid of him. You wouldn't dare touch him. So we learn that he's contemporary with man. No good talking about this if it wasn't contemporary with man. Can't be harpooned. Got terrible teeth. Strong scales. Pointed footprints. Smoke and fire comes out of his nostrils. And is the king of animals and is fearless. Now, my Bible margin suggests a crocodile. Well, they do have sharp teeth and they do have these pointed bits at the back and when they walk, they do leave these marks. And they found fossilised giant crocodiles. Uh, the sarcosuchus is uh, about 12 metres, so that would uh, probably the, the length of the chairs here, so pretty big. But I've never seen a crocodile with smoke coming out of its mouth. Now, it doesn't make sense that that was a bit of poetic license. The description we have here is of an animal. And, you know, this is just one of the aspects of it. It is able to produce fire out of its mouth. don't know what creature it was, but we do find among the dinosaur fossils creatures like this one, which has a very strange horn. It goes backwards. Now horns are used for fighting, aren't they? And a horn that goes backwards is really a bit of a waste. You can't fight with it. And it is thought that perhaps this, because they've analysed the structure of this strange horn, that this was a means of producing fire. And the artist is just showing it in use there. This uh, has uh, this nasal passage and a middle passageway and these meeting points. And it, it is thought that perhaps there could have been a mechanism within here which given the right circumstances, could project fire. Now, we are aware of creatures that produce electricity, fireflies and sea creatures and that, but we also are acquainted with creatures on a totally different scale to this huge creature uh, that produce fire. The bombardier beetle does exactly that. It is able to fire out from its back um, gases at 100 degrees centigrade. And that is achieved through a complex system of uh, storage sacks where the two different hydrogen peroxide and the hydroquinone are, are kept separate. But then there is a mixing chamber where the two can be brought together. And in bringing those two together with uh, other chemicals which are there, which uh, the cells secrete, it then produces this explosive gas at uh, 100 degrees uh, centigrade. And uh, it's able to fire up to 20 shots at a time. And uh, as these photographs show, it has complete control over the direction in which it fires. Um, it can go underneath it to back side. Uh, there are these little paddles which can direct it. So we shouldn't say, well, that's impossible that this creature could have produced fire out of its mouth because we have living examples of creatures that do exactly that. So why don't we, why haven't we got a world that is full of dinosaurs today? Why did they die out? Well, the evolutionists have their ideas and we have our ideas. Uh, one that a meteor hit the earth and wipe them out, but surely it will wipe all life out, but that's by the way. Uh, other theories is that the temperature either rose too much and that caused them to die out, or that it sank so low that it caused them to die out. 
Uh, even bizarre ones that they got constipation and so died out, or they got so obese that they died out. Or the, the very latest one is that they had parasites which attacked them and ate at their jaws, and so they couldn't eat and died out. Well, um, we do know uh, that dinosaurs are able to live in quite different conditions, and very recently they found up in the Arctic remains of dinosaurs and uh, we just skim through this uh, they're still talking that they uh, died out 68 million years ago but paleontologists unearthed a wide range of dinosaur fossils in Russia the average temperature at the time would have been about 10 degrees centigrade and the conclusion of the article was dinosaurs were incredibly diverse in polar regions as diverse as in tropical regions it was a big surprise to us so it wasn't change of temperature or anything like that well, I think the Bible will give us the answer. We believe that these dinosaur creatures were contemporary with man. We do find tracks which show human footprints along dinosaur footprints. We just marked them up. But we have many historical writings which speak of these dinosaur-like creatures which were contemporary with man but were exterminated because they were frightening to man. And uh, Beowulf, who lived 500 AD um, in Denmark, he uh, became famous because of the attacks that he made on the large land creatures and sea creatures. And there are the chronicles that... Um, explained to us as an epic poem of the 6th to 8th century which describe um, how he uh, conquered these creatures and some of them were bipedal like those ones we saw at the church with two small forelimbs uh, but they had very strong jaws and very tough skins you couldn't get a sword uh, through their skins uh, very ugly creatures hunted mainly at night and how he slew them was to get hold of these smaller forelimbs and tear them off. You've had your dinner, so be right to say that. Um, and fascinatingly, there is a Babylonian seal, I think it's in the British Museum, um, which depicts exactly that in Babylonian times. This warrior slaying this Bible pedal creature by tearing its loom. And, you know, sounds very much like the creatures that are depicted around Breeden Church. And uh, other creatures that he slew with these flying reptiles and dragons. But there are ancient chronicles of British history, Geoffrey Monmouth's, uh, written about uh, 1100 AD. And he recounts stories of um, how the King of Wales uh, was eaten by a monster. Uh, now, I think it's quite safe to go around Wales today, but uh, in those days it wasn't. There were monsters that could eat you. And in fact, not in this chronicle, but there are writings right up to the latest, I can find, 1867, so 150 years ago, accounts of people in the countryside being very frightened by these big animals that were in existence. Um, but with time, they have died out or been killed off. Now, if we think of them as part of God's creation, then they were obviously contemporary with man. But I believe that God made these big creatures deliberately for a purpose. And that is to be his lawnmowers. We know before the flood that the conditions on the earth were quite different to conditions today. And there was abundant vegetation. And it needed these big creatures to keep the vegetation down, as it were. Noah would take them onto the ark. Now, how could he fit a creature which is three times the size of this room into the ark? Well, very simple solution to that. The purpose of Adam, of Adam, of Noah, um, well, he didn't take the animals on. God brought the animals to Noah to go onto the ark. The purpose of the animals going on the ark was that when the flood was finished, these animals could repopulate the earth. So it will be abundantly clear that you're not going to take onto the ark an old dinosaur. 
you're going to take a young couple of dinosaurs who've got a long life ahead of them. Now, even the biggest dinosaur came from an egg about the size of a rugby ball. And so they all go through stages of growing. Uh, and the interesting thing about reptiles, cold-blooded creatures, is that unlike humans, and your parents are very grateful that this is true, that unlike humans, cold-blooded creatures don't stop growing. They carry on growing and growing and growing till the time of their death. Uh, and we'll come back to that in a second. So I, I believe that in the change conditions after the flood, when lives were shortened and uh, so many things did change uh, after the flood, that the need for these animals uh, was gone. And slowly, over a long period of time, they would die out. They would be shorter lives, so they wouldn't grow so big. Uh, I already mentioned that. Um, we know how men lived much longer before the flood, so it's reasonable to think the animals likewise, so that many of these big creatures are no more than creatures we know today, which have lived two or three times longer than they do today, and therefore attained huge proportions. So we would expect remains of creatures before the flood to be on a much bigger scale. And, you know, we find giant almost everything. These are, that's a giant toad with a, a, an orbital toad in, in front of it. But, you know, we find in the fossils and ammonites, huge, much bigger than they are today. Oysters, much bigger than they are today. And after the flood, the atmosphere would change. Uh, we understand that it would be harder if the... Uh, Atmospheric pressure was less. It would be harder for the blood to reach the heads of these big creatures. There would be less food around. And there was less oxygen. One can, by analysing the oxygen in amber, you can see that there's far less oxygen in the world today than there was uh, just after the flood. So conditions changed. The need for these creatures died out. Uh, and the creatures themselves died out. And so... Um, that's why we have these historical, why the carver at uh, Breeden Church by Babylon, they can depict these animals because they were in existence then. But they're not in existence now. We just have remains. Have they totally disappeared? Well, probably not. Because uh, what we see today as lizards were probably the dinosaurs of yesterday. But dying much younger, therefore much shorter. And so that's what was so interesting about this uh, one they found in Australia. You know, they had to admit that it's just like a, a Komodo dragon, which uh, they're horrible creatures, and so they will attack you if they can. You have to keep away from them. Uh, and we'll be very fearful. And I say these only grow up to about three metres long because they only live about 60 years. But if they're living... 100, 200, 300 years, as they could well do before the flood, growing all the time. Can you imagine a, a fearsome creature with terrible sharp teeth, you know, uh, not three metres long, but 10 metres long, 15 metres long, very fearful. Right, well, we have actually got to Jurassic Park, but I don't want to say much about it, but the concept of Jurassic Park... I've never watched it, so I don't know, but I'm told. The idea is, is the storyline is recreating from fossil remains, from DNA, recreating the dinosaur that was supposed to exist millions of years ago. But the chances of being able to recreate ancient DNA, if you could find it fresh enough, um, it is infinitely small, so I am told. I'm no expert on this. And somebody drew this lovely uh, parallel, which I just put before you. Imagine a book which has got 400 pages in it. And unfortunately, it's gone through the shredder. You know what paper shredders, what it all looks like. And your task is to piece that 400-page book back together again. 
And before you put your hand up and volunteer, you should know it's written in a language which you don't understand. And there is another condition about uh, volunteering to put this book together from all these 400 pages all shredded and in a foreign language, is that you're going to have one hand tied behind your back. And there is one other slight complication which you really ought to know about before you put your hand up, that you're going to be put into a room which is in complete darkness. Now the chance of you being able to piece together a 400 page book shredded in a language you don't understand with one hand tied behind your back and in darkness is pretty remote, isn't it? Well, so is the uh, possibility of recreating these creatures. But, you see, fiction makes money, doesn't it? So the Jurassic 1 um, grossed them more than a million. I uh, understand that Jurassic Park 4 is due to be released this year. Don't bother to go and see it.